All right, hopefully that's working for everyone. Cool. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carrie Summers, and as Rick said, I'm um, from New Zealand, and I own Altitude Pole and Fitness. So we're a pole dance and fitness studio based in New Zealand um, for the moment. <laughs> so here's my story uh, of how my business has kind of grown and how I've grown over the last six to seven years um, and how NP have worked with me through that. So basically, how did I go from software engineer to pole dancer? As a child, I was a gymnast, um, competitive gymnast, and I'm sure anyone out there who did competitive sports as a child knows, it really does instill a really good work ethic in you and um, teaches you how to cope with goals and not always winning. So when I left gymnastics when I was about 18 years old, I kind of had a problem. I couldn't really find anything that ignited that same passion in me, that gymnastics. When you're young, there's a whole range of stuff you can do from ballet to tap to triathlons. But when you're an adult, it seems like the only way you can get fit is by going for um, long runs or going to a gym, which I'm sure is great for most of you out there listening. Um, but for me, I really didn't enjoy going to a gym. and I still hate running. I just didn't have that motivation from it. But I still really liked being active and fit. So I was living in UK when I found pole dancing. One of my workmates was going along to classes and I decided to join her. And it really was just love at first sight for me. So from my first class, I was totally addicted. Uh, it wasn't long before I got my own pole at home and I was competing around UK. And it, it just gave me everything that I'd missed from my youth. So it literally is like flying around a gym. And obviously I'm not trying to sell pole dancing to you guys here, but if you haven't tried it, you definitely should. It really is a fun way to get fit. So I moved back to New Zealand and my big goal was just to, um, to share this amazing thing that I'd found. And there were a couple of studios in Christchurch where I live at the time, but they weren't doing things in the same style that I liked um, with my fitness background and in a very structured learning way that I'd gotten used to from gymnastics. So I decided to open a space. Uh, and when I say open a space, it was literally rent a room by the hour that I could put up the four poles that I'd won in various competitions and basically start teaching my old gymnast friends who were going through a similar struggle to me. Um, and I really just wanted to share my passion with the world and have my own training space because I wanted to keep competing. So obviously this was a great start to opening a business, right? No planning, no thinking it through, just let's see what happens. And I had a job at the same time. So it wasn't long before I came into a lot of challenges. And I guess the biggest one was definitely time. I was doing as much as I possibly could find to do. So I had my full-time job. Um, I was still competing internationally by this stage. So I was training kind of 10 to 20 hours a week. Um, and I had a husband at home who, you know, kind of wanted to see me in the evenings every now and then. And the studio was growing. It, it was taking off without me putting too much effort in. Um, but the excitement was there and I was teaching more and more classes and um, it was just getting busier and busier and I was struggling to keep up. And then throw in the Christchurch earthquake. So for those of you who don't know, we had a big earthquake here in Christchurch about seven years ago. Um, and it was actually 10 days before my wedding. So this time was crazy for me. But I guess the good part was it shut my studio down so I couldn't work um, and was forced to take that time off. But it, it really forced a few things on me as well. I had to make the decision of what I was going to do next because I lost the space that we had as our studio at that time. So I had to make the decision whether to, to really go for it with this thing and hire a space or lease a space by myself um, or just shut it down. And, you know, I was loving it. So I didn't want to do that. And we had quite a few students who were loving it too. So it was at that point that I found a new space and got lawyers involved and contracts and that things started to get official. I had to actually pay money to fit the space out and I had it full time. Um, but I still had my job on the side. It still was a very much a hobby thing for me. It's just that I was taking that next step and once again, not really thinking it through, um, which seemed to be a common thing for me. You might notice in this story. <laughs> So we were getting busier and busier, but I really just let things happen by themselves. I started to hire new instructors who were literally some of our students who were doing really well. And I was like, yep, come on in, teach for us. Here's our curriculums. And it was just a bunch of friends doing something we loved. Um, and there was a lot of passion. There was a lot of fun, but there was a lot of time being taken up on my side. 
And the instructors probably didn't get that because for them it was still a couple hours a week that they got to be this um, amazing instructor at this awesome job that they loved on the side. And it was a really prestigious thing for them to be doing. And it got harder and harder to do. Around the time I got pregnant with my first time, my first child, um, I had an opportunity to open a second studio in Auckland, which is in a whole different island from where I am. So it's about um, an hour's drive, no, sorry, an hour's flight, probably like a 10 hours drive from where I live. But it seemed to me at the time that the universe was telling me to, to make this step. So some of my instructors were moving up there. It was a really big city with um, some really rubbish studios at the time. And I just knew there was an opportunity there to do it. So I thought once again, yep, why not? Let's open this new studio. The first one was busy. It was um, doing well in terms of we had a lot of students and we were doing well at competitions. Our class content was really good because I knew how to write curriculums from my time as a gymnastics coach. Um, there was just no consistency. But I decided to go for it. I was having a second child, so why not open a second studio as well? Sorry, I was having my first child at that point. Second child's later on. So that's when it all kind of started coming crashing down. So I'm sure a lot of people who um, have gone down this path as well, but it's, it's hard. So time was still a big issue. Um, I really was just struggling. I gave up the day job at this point and decided to make a go of it with altitude, but I, I had no idea what I was doing. And I think it just highlighted over and over again that I knew nothing about running a business. This was a hobby to me and there was no way I could take an income from it. There was no consistency. Um, and I had no idea what I was doing on the business side of things. Teaching was fine, but I couldn't teach all the hours. We were up to kind of 30, 40 classes a week at that point, and I couldn't do them all. So I was relying more and more on instructors who had come on in such a casual way that they didn't realize the commitment it was for me to have this business running. For them, it was still just a bit of fun on the side. So they would cancel last minute or you know, not doing things like locking up or cleaning up. They would show up, teach their class and leave. And don't get me wrong, like they loved the space and they were really, really good to me, but they just didn't have that same um, involvement in it that I had and they didn't see that. I had no exit plan for the studio and it was clear that one day I was probably going to have to just shut it down. There was no way I could sell it because it was all based around me. And the second studio wasn't doing too well. I wasn't there. Um, and the people who I had in place up there, I kind of expected them to be doing it for the love of it because there was no money to pay them. And so it didn't really work out. So just as the first studio was starting to make a profit, the second studio started sucking all that up. But I got into this mindset that I was doing it for the love. And that was what was meant to be important, right? That I was doing something I really enjoyed and I had passion for, this big P word, passion. Um, and so I kind of just accepted that this was how it had to be, that studios don't make money in New Zealand. Um, and at least I wasn't in a nine to five job at an office doing something I hated. You know, I was doing something I loved with people I loved. And maybe I wasn't getting paid for it. And maybe I had to work really hard for nothing in return. But passion, it was all meant to be how it was. So I kind of just accepted that fact and went on. So then things had to change. I was on holiday in UK at the time and I was spending most of that holiday on my laptop checking in on things um, because the studio wasn't really running itself without me there. And somebody tagged me in a story on Facebook about another pole studio owner who MP had helped um, and everything about it just just hit me so hard. And I started looking into MPE's website and just devouring every client story I could find. And just again and again, it hit me just the situation I'd got into. And I don't think I'd even realized until then how bad it really was. Like I had no way out. The studio would either have to shut down or I'd be working until the end for nothing. And as much as I loved it, it was gonna suck out that love and that passion, which is probably sadder than just shutting down the studio. So I kind of realized that I had no choice. I had to make a change. And there were some people that were, that were understanding what I was going through. And I think that was probably the biggest thing because nobody else I knew understood. I could rant and rave to them about how hard it was, my friends and family, but they didn't get it. They weren't invested like I was. And these people got it and they understood and they were saying they had a solution. So I went for it. 
and it really was hard. Um, it was a whole new way of doing things. And I've got to admit that for the first few months with NPE, I thought I'd made a mistake. And I was like, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't understand pole dancing studios. I mean, maybe they understand gyms, but they don't understand pole dancing and studios and the way we're meant to run. But I had no choice. So I just kept working through things with them a little bit reluctantly, but I did it. And we started with the pricing and packaging changes. And again, it was so different. Nobody had ever done contracts or memberships with Pole Studio in New Zealand. Um, and here I was meant to be asking people to sign up to a 12 month contract when they hadn't even touched a pole, this brand new thing. But it, it was working and I went for it and we, we managed to put those prices up. The next thing was a sales system. And before that, people could just purchase some class credits online, book into a class online, and then turn up, disappear, and we'd never know. So this new sales system was really weird to me. Um, I just couldn't get my head around this whole consult thing and leads. I didn't even know what a lead was. Um, but again, I had no choice. I just worked through it and we moved on. And there were so many light bulb moments over that first kind of six to seven months with MPE. And that was incredibly frustrating because something would click with me. Um, and I would get it all of a sudden, and it would seem so simple, and yet I'd been doing it wrong this whole time. And I guess it's, it's kind of like what we say about losing weight, like it's very simple, but it doesn't mean it's easy. But yeah, hindsight, fun. <laughs> so how did it go? It went pretty well. I just kept working through things, implementing each of the strategies, each of the suggestions, um, and just kind of taking a leap of faith the whole time. For once, I could predict the business income, and from that, I could make some goals with actual numbers, and I could break those goals down into targets, um, and I could kind of see what was going to happen in the studio, and I could fix it as it came up. And for me, that was a massive thing. It wasn't easy. I was spending more time in this business in the studio than I had before and that was really hard because to me I'd come to the to MBA because I already felt like I was working too hard and here I was having to work harder than ever before. Um, you know, having to go in for consults and track all these numbers and systemize everything and try all this new stuff was really challenging and I had to push myself out of my comfort zone again and again and I had to ask other people to trust me. So standing up in front of my instructors and explaining all these new changes was probably one of the scariest things. They didn't like it. They'd come into this place that was a, just a club, pretty much, of friends. And here I was becoming this business person and, and putting prices up and contracts for our members and demanding that they showed up and tracking payments if they didn't pay. And it didn't sit well with them. And it, I mean, to be honest, it didn't really sit well with me either. This was my baby and here I was again turning it into a business. But it was working and it became so much easier on me and as I got out of the business, as I started being able to get people into those roles, things just got easier and easier. And it started to work. So we've been with MPE for about two and a half years now. When we started, we had two studios and one was doing all right, making an inconsistent profit and the other was losing all of that profit that the first was making. Now we've got both studios making at around 30% net profit each month. Um, and we have a target of that 30 to 40 percent and we try and hit that every month. We make about 70k in revenue between the two studios each month and again that's consistent so I know I can work off that in the future and it's been growing for the last two and a half years towards that and I can do this. This is probably the biggest thing to me. Um, I've always loved numbers but I've never been able to break my business down into numbers but being able to see exactly how many leads we get in, what the percentage is leads to prospect, prospect to consult, consult to completed consult and to member. This lets me step out of the business and let my staff do everything. I can spend an hour a week looking at these kind of numbers, which are all color coded, and I can see straight away if there's any problems and I can straight away jump on them with that staff member and fix them. Um, and to me, this is really the secret to our success, these spreadsheets, these numbers, and this is all stuff that I never would have been able to do if MP hadn't even shown me what a lead was. So being able to break down my, my business like this has been huge for me. And it really has allowed me to step back. Uh, and I'm no longer in the day-to-day -day running of the studios. They run themselves with staff members. And I literally see how it goes from these and just checking in with those staff members 
um, once a week. So just to give you an idea, this is our first studio in Christchurch, so the one we moved into after the earthquake um, that we were in for about five years. And as you can see, it's a, it's a long skinny room, it's got nine poles. Um, there was another room just off to the side that had six poles and that room would get, it had no windows, so it would get so slippery and gross after a booty camp class that people would literally slip over off the sweat on the floor. We had mushrooms growing in the corner. Um, but this was probably one of the nicest studios in New Zealand at the time. And this is when we were kind of, you know, we were doing pretty well in this studio, but we hit capacity. So last year in June, we moved to a new studio location in Christchurch, one that was four times bigger. And here's some photos of that one here. So you can see we've got three rooms now. Um, each of those single rooms is bigger than our whole studio combined was before that. We've got two pole rooms, each with 12 poles. We've got a dedicated aerial and stretch um, dance room. There's a waiting area, consult room. And it's got state-of-the-art lighting. It, it really is like a very beautiful space and by far the biggest in um, New Zealand. And it could probably rival some of those top studios in Australia as well. Um, and then eight months ago, I had this little dude down here. I had my second child, another little boy. And that was really a big thing for me. I mean, I know having a kid is always a big thing, but um, two years ago, I never would have thought it possible to have a second child because it would have meant closing down the business and I would have had to have made that really tough choice. But instead of having to close down the business, when I had Carter eight months ago, I took three months off work. Um, my husband got the maternity leave transferred to him, so he got four months off work and I paid myself from the business that whole time. So we had both me and my husband not working for four months and we were still getting paid our normal wage. And not only did those studios continue um, without me, but they thrived. They probably did better without me there than when I was there. <laughs> so that was a really exciting time. I shared this graph at my talk last year at Mega Training, um, just to kind of show the member growth and the sizing of the studios over the last few years. So 2016, when we started with MPE and we switched over our members from that casual rate, we managed to get 51 members signed on to memberships, so contracts. We made a goal to try and reach 100 members by Christmas, and we managed to do that in September. So we nearly doubled our growth in about, I think it's probably about five months. And then at my talk last year at Mega Training, so September 2017, I was really excited that we'd made it to 280 members. And that was a huge thing for me at the time. We'd more than doubled our growth um, in our membership base in a year. And so a year on today, so what are we, December, um, between the two studios, we're now at 430 members. And both studios have actually hit capacity now. We can't grow either studio anymore. Even after moving Christchurch a year ago to a place four times bigger, it's just grown. It's grown from 100 members to 200 and 40, I think we're on now, and we don't have space to add any more classes, unfortunately. But interestingly, when I left Mega Training last year, I actually came back with a really nervous and this feeling of fear. So creating this presentation last year had really highlighted to me just how fast we'd grown and how well things were going. And that made me worry. I'd heard all these stories there about other people who'd hit challenges and come through but I hadn't hit any of those challenges yet. And it really made me nervous that things just couldn't continue like this. So I talked it through with my NPE coach, Tom, at the time. And he encouraged me not to waste time on fears because there was, there was no point. And that I just couldn't get complacent about things. And I had to just keep pushing forwards to whatever that direction took me. And so we did. So I've always wanted to franchise Altitude Pole. And about two months ago, we went public that we were, and we've moved in this direction now. Um, being able to step back from the day-to-day -day business allowed me to not only write up a massive operations manual about how we do everything, but really test and tweak all of those systems along the way and systemize everything. So I was confident that the two studios were successful without me being there and that I could hand over these operations manual to almost anyone and that they would be successful too. I really wanted to provide people with the same opportunity that I had. My life is amazing right now. I had this business that I love and I get paid well from it. And I wanted to give that chance to other people. There's a lot of passion in the pole industry 
and um, a lot of people think they can go into opening a studio and it, it fails just like mine did but because there's so much passion we keep pushing through and there's just too many studio owners out there who continue to do their full-time job and they don't get to really invest the time and the energy and the love into what they're doing and the studio fails and the students aren't getting the space they deserve and it just doesn't work. So I really wanted to support people to lead a life they love doing something they love. And we really want to help owners be successful, which in turn is going to bring pole to more people. And to me, that's only a good thing. I've seen over and over again what pole dancing can do for people's confidence and the stories that come out of our students is amazing. The more people I can bring that to, the better. So I made a goal. Everyone kept asking me what my five-year plan was. And I thought, okay, five years time, I want to have five altitudes in New Zealand. It had a nice kind of ring to it, five and five. About three weeks before I went public with the whole franchise opportunity, um, I had a call with Andre, Sean and Tiffany from NPE. And once again, they kind of challenged me a bit. And once again, I got off the call and I was like, well, oh, they don't know what this means to me. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't understand New Zealand or pole dancing. And it just kind of sat with me over the weekend. And once again, I had a light bulb moment and I realized I'd fallen back into the track of thinking about the franchise as a passion, as a hobby of mine and not as a business. And it needed to be both. So I re-looked at things and I, I reworked my goal. And I decided about three weeks before we went public that I was going to have 100 altitudes in five years. No longer five, I want 100. And I was going to try and take it to the United States. So, so far, we announced it about two months ago. Um, the first altitude franchise opened up four weeks ago and is currently sitting on about 42 members. So they're doing really well. It's in a small town in New Zealand with about 40,000 people. So that was always going to be a big test for, for the system and um, the pricing and everything. We have two more opening up in January. So those are about to be announced um, next week. So keep your eye out for that. They'll be they'll starting their six week opening campaign next week. And that's all about to go public. And then there are another two that we plan on opening in probably middle of next year. So at the moment, we're trying to keep, we had a lot of response when we first launched this, and I wanted to be very strict on who I let the first few people in to open. Um, and we wanted to do two every six months so that we really had the resources to support them and continue tweaking things and make sure that it all worked before we start kind of pushing things to that next level. But the really exciting thing for me is that someone from the United States has reached out and um, is planning to open an altitude as well. So we're just working through all the legalities of that, how that would work and what that looks like. Um, but to have reached that kind of stage already with two months after launching the whole franchise thing is extremely exciting. So this is just a copy of a print that I give all of our new franchisee owners. Um, and I don't know if you know this song, but in the background, there's some lyrics there to the song, I Hope You Dance. And these lyrics have always stuck with me. They're very, um, they're all about staying humble, but taking the opportunities when they arise. And that's always been very big for me is to take risks. Maybe I should think them through a bit more, but I've always been a bit of a risk taker and then you just work hard enough to make them pay off. Um, but things with altitude now are at a place that I never would have expected when I first started. And things with my life are at a place that I never would have thought possible. Uh, I work 20 hours a week and my husband works 16 hours a week. So between us, we don't even do a full-time job. And yet I'm managing to take an income that was more than when I was a software engineer. So for me, that's everything. Lifestyle, I get to spend it with my kids and I still get to enjoy the income side of things. I didn't have to give that up in the end. Um, but things with me personally have really changed. And I think I've learned that I can not just run a successful business, but I've learned to be a success myself and really think bigger than, than what I probably would have if I hadn't reached out to MPE. And living in New Zealand, it's very easy to think small and kind of live in this, this little fish kind of pond situation. But working with MPE, they have forced me to step outside my comfort zone and think like an American maybe. Um, which is completely different for me, but I'm loving it. And these next six altitudes are really just a stepping stone on to the next big thing for me. Um, and from there, who knows? Like maybe I'll retire um, or maybe I'll start a whole new business. But the point is that from now on, anything is possible for me. And that's what I wish for everyone. So thank you for listening. <laughs> It's absolutely amazing, Carrie. Thank you so much for sharing.